Hi, it's Drake Richards of Sitting Wisdom. Now you may be saying, Dre, okay, you got me convinced. That sounds all fine and dandy, this idea of positive aging. Sure, I'm happy about aging, Dre. But it's fair to say that everything won't always be rainbows and skills. So what do I do when I have these challenges in retirement? And you already know, I've told you the three main challenges that people have in retirement is they're worried about running out of money, they're worried about their overall health care expenses, and they're worried about lifelong happiness, what they're going to do with their time. And when it comes to you being able to overcome these challenges and obstacles, which they will happen, that's just a normal part of life. You guys hear me say all the time that it's a cycle. The things ebbs and flows that when the economy goes up, you know that at some point it's going to peak and then it's going to start going down. And then you know that at some point we'll hit the floor and then it's going to go back up. That there are certain cycles that we have. Same cycles when it comes to the seasons. You and I both know that after every winter comes a spring. There isn't anything that we can do to change that. Every single time we have a winter, things die, it's it cold. And then we have spring and things are reborn and they're renewed. We understand that there are certain cycles that things go through. And so when it comes to you being able to overcome these challenges, I find that Jeremiah 29, 11 gives us a great idea. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. So it really comes down to hope. And I can go into a ton of verses on hope. There are some in the Bible that are very interesting where it talks about this idea that it's better to be a person who's alive and poor with hope for tomorrow than a very rich, wealthy king who is now dead because there is no more hope and their life is over. So when it comes to us having hope, it says a plan is tied to hope. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. So you have to put a plan together. That's the way I read it. You may have gotten a different conclusion, but I find that if you have a plan, you feel better about the future. So I'll give you a story to help drive the point home. I remember that my three younger girls were planning on walking to school. I remember the anxiety that I had. I was sitting there saying like, oh my gosh, I don't, I don't know what we're going to do. I, I, they're not ready to walk to school. I'm not ready for them to walk to school. There are so many dangers that are going to happen. What do I do? And instead of me saying, okay, well, I'm not going to allow them to walk to school. What we did is we started putting plans in place so that I was confident and comfortable that they would be safe and okay when they walked to school. And so we started walking together. Yeah. I would put our dog on on the leash and then we would go out and we would go walking. We would walk a mile or we'd walk half a mile. And I would say, this is how you cross the road. This is the right opportunity. You see that car, it seems like it's far away, but you can tell by the speed that it's driving that it's actually going to come much quicker. And the kids would be like, oh, okay, all right, interesting. And then I would say, well, we're on the sidewalk and this is the side that we're normally on. Then you would do this when people come up. And you'd always think together about this distance, right? Nothing too crazy, but let's make sure we're all within a few feet of each other. And then whenever you cross one of the streets where the sidewalk breaks the street out, we would always wait for each other. You always cross those roads together as a group. And we went over the worst case scenarios. If someone has a dog that's off the leash, this is what you do. If someone tries to kidnap you, run into the street and scream. They were like, Dad, when we get hit by a car? And I was like, oh, that's a chance to get hit by a car. But what I have found is that when people are kidnapping people, their hope is that you're very quiet, that you don't draw a lot of attention to them. So you're going to draw the most attention that you could draw to yourself. And the most attention we could draw is standing in the road screaming. Most of the time, the person's going to leave. And then we would walk and I would remind them. I'd say, hey, what did we do wrong? And they'd like, oh, we're supposed to do this and that. And a little bit of time, I would allow them to go a quarter mile ahead of me and then a half a mile ahead of me. And then a whole mile ahead of me. And I would just be kind of in the back watching them. And then we would discuss and debrief over what happened. And then we would make adjustments to the plan as new things happen. Like, oh, I didn't tell you about that. Well, this is how you deal with that. Or they would argue, well, who was in charge? And I would be like, well, I don't know if anyone's in charge. But eventually we did have to create some sort of a hierarchy so that they could resolve arguments. What if someone was going too slow or had to go to the bathroom or they had a friend that they could walk with? All of these were different events that we slowly added into the plan. And then at some point we all were like, all right, I'm ready. And then they would go out and I would sit in the house and then they would come back and then we would talk about it. And I was able to build that plan and they were able to build their experience of wisdom to where everybody felt really good about that. And I remember my wife, because she wasn't in the planning where she still had that anxiety. She still had that nervous feeling where she was like, are you sure that you're going to let them do this? And I was like, we've been preparing for this. We're ready for this. Your retirement is very similar. For you to have a future and a hope, you have to have a plan for what we're going to do. It's true that you're probably going to have at least one recession in your retirement. What's your plan to do with the recession? 
it's true that we're probably going to have inflation and inflation is a real thing. Thing that you necessarily didn't want or know that you're going to pay taxes on. If you put a plan in place to combat those three largest concerns that you'll have in retirement, and I call that our wealthy retirement system, which is I need to make sure I don't run out of money. I need to make sure I have a high quality of health care. I need to make sure I enjoy my time, that it's fulfilling for lifelong happiness. If you're able to put a plan in place to check off those three boxes, I have found that most people feel really good in retirement. But just as with my kids, it doesn't mean that we know everything. Sometimes you just get started and then you have to make adjustments. Where there was something that nobody expected to happen, happen. Well, what do we do? We go back to the drawing board and we make small adjustments, small tweaks. And then we move forward and we pray just as I did that my children never have to deal with any of the things that I prepared them for. But we know that they are prepared, that they are ready for the craziness. And so when it comes to you having a positive outlook on aging, whatever your concerns are, write them down. And then look up strategies that you can implement to solve those when they happen. If you're worried about not being as sharp mentally when you get older, you can Google strategies to stay mentally sharp and put a plan together and then you can do those things on a regular basis. If you're worried about your physical strength or your relationships or your money, then you can put a money plan, a physical strength plan, and a relationship plan together. You can put a holistic plan together that covers all of the concerns that you have so that way you know what you're going to do. If you're worried about being bored in retirement, then we need to find things that you enjoy doing. I often tell people to think back to things they enjoyed doing when they were a kid and start to pick up those habits and activities again. My wife has the saying where she'll always say that we were born perfect. And the idea is that we are born fully aware of ourselves, things that we enjoyed, things that we laughed at, liked to eat, things like that. And as a baby, you could not make us do something we didn't want to do. If I wanted to be picked up, I screamed as loud as I could. I was not worried about, oh, will that hurt someone's feelings? Oh, will that wake up someone who's tired? Babies don't care. They're going to scream because they want to be picked up. If they wanted the food, they ate it. If they didn't want the food, they threw it on the floor. And as we get older, society puts the stability straitjacket on us where we're slowly constricted. We're slowly confined into what is seen as normal and acceptable where kids are seen and not heard and this color is acceptable to wear and that color isn't and you should eat the vegetables because there's poor kids somewhere that don't have any food to eat. And all these things slowly become constricting and they become our stability straitjacket. And we sometimes lose a portion of ourselves in that process. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily good or bad. Some of the things are necessary to be taught and some of the things probably not so much. That there are some things that are culturally were done and as you got older, you realize, okay, well, well I'm not going to do that anymore. Right? So for example, I don't with my children. It's not that I have an issue with people who do. I just know that it's something that we culturally do in the South. Well, why do we culturally do it in the South? Because we're whip slaves. Culturally, it's something that's more common in black families because that was how we were taught. That was what we believed is how people were put in line. And at some point, I decided, well, if I have to send my kids to school and all these other places, then I don't expect any of those adults to whip my children. And I'm their parent, and I have the most influence, and I spend the most time with them. And I expect those other adults to be able to successfully get my kids to listen to them. Well, then how can I expect anything less of myself? That's ultimately the decision that I made. That's the decision that my wife and I agreed to. And so we don't whip our kids. That was just something that we decided to do a little bit different. And so it was always important for us to go back and review some of the things we were taught as children and to decide whether that has brought us closer to our goals and the dream life and the fulfillment and the happiness that we're looking for, or has it pushed us further away from our goals? and the dream life and the happiness and the fulfillment that we are looking for. I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on something that brings you pleasure and something that brings you purpose as you're preparing for retirement. If you found value in this video, I thank you always for your time. Thank you for being with me. It could have been anywhere and I don't take it for granted. If you found value, go ahead and like and subscribe so you can continue receiving valuable insights on how to create your own wealth and retirement system so that you can worry less and live more. Until next time, stay safe and enjoy life.